Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this webinar. I'm Kate Bryan from Fertility Network UK. Unfortunately, Anita from Fertility Europe is unable to be with us today due to a last minute emergency. But we'd like to start today with Dr. Edgar Mokanu. Could you introduce yourself? Good morning, Kate. Good morning, um, everybody. Uh, yes, I'm Edgar Mokanu. I'm a um, consultant in obstetrics and gynecology at the Rotunda Hospital in Dublin, which is um, a maternity hospital. I'm also a subspecialist in reproductive medicine, and uh, I'm pleased to be here to discuss with you issues related to fertility. Thank you. Um, I know that you've been very involved in the creation of the IFFS campaign, Thinking of Having a Baby. Um, why did you decide to launch this campaign? Uh, the IFFS um, believes that time is right for uh, fertility awareness to be brought to the attention not only of patients, but maybe uh, to the attention of practitioners, politicians, and of course, the influencers around the world. Yet with the um, COVID pandemic, it didn't look opportune to create a fertility awareness campaign. So we decided to create a campaign uh, addressing directly the patients uh, with a view of encouraging them to pursue their desire to have a family. So that's the background. Could you tell us a bit about the feedback you're getting at the moment from your member organizations about the epidemic and how it's affecting patients in Europe? Um, currently, the, um, the pandemic has um, a lower impact compared to March and April. Uh, as we all know, and if uh, people are not aware, the Escher website has a full set of slides with how the pandemic impacted the services, the ART services in Europe in March and April. And while initially everything was closed, gradually by May, all the activity was back up. Um, so patients could avail of ART therapies. Um, nowadays, um, I'm not aware of any fertility services closing down, but obviously vast majority of ART units will apply quite strict and rigorous um, containment uh, protocols, including testing of patients before they uh, proceed. So what do we know at the moment about the consequences of COVID-19 during pregnancy on mothers and their babies? And are there any specific specifics linked to fertility management that patients should be aware of? Yes, the, um, we have no information at present in relation to pregnancy. So do we know if women that are diagnosed with COVID and they're just in the first 12 weeks of pregnancy. Do we know if that has an impact? We don't know. Yet the outcome of those pregnancies will start coming into mainstream towards the end of this year. Uh, we do know nevertheless that women that are at the highest risk of becoming sick uh, with COVID and with advanced disease are women that already have a medical condition. Um, so, Current advice in terms of proceeding with ART therapy will be to uh, assess the medical background appropriately and only then decide. So if somebody has diabetes, if somebody has renal disease, if somebody has severe uh, respiratory disease, uh, one should consider postponing the treatment for the time being. Um, on the off chance that if she becomes pregnant, she is at a higher risk of all COVID complications, including ventilation and, of course, death. Um, we know that it's thought that about one in six couples around the world experience some form of fertility problems. Do you have any data about the number of children conceived through assisted reproduction techniques? Um, it will be nearly impossible to say how many children have been conceived up to now because all registries work um, uh, two or three years uh, back. So in order to collect the data, um, it will take two or three years. But in any case, we're talking millions. A few years ago, there were five millions. In recent times, it's said that there are at least eight million children. Now, it's important to understand this is not the number of treatment cycles that happen, it's the number of children that you're asking, yes. And when should someone who's found out that they're experiencing fertility problems, when should they first seek medical help? 
um, there isn't an immediate general answer to this. Um, I uh, believe that firstly, uh, couples or um, individuals need to uh, look at themselves and analyze if there is a specific risk factor already present before they even start. So let's say that somebody had, um, as a male, undescended testicles and surgery to um, bring them down, or as a female, somebody had surgery to the fallopian tubes, or somebody had uh, cancer therapy and chemo and radiotherapy, irrespective if it's a woman or a man. In those circumstances, those backgrounds will already place that individual at a higher risk of not being able to conceive. So those individuals should seek help from the beginning. Otherwise, if there is no specific so-called risk in the background, as a general rule, uh, in women that are younger than 36, 12 months of uh, trying is okay. In women that are older than 36, after six months, one should see a physician to organize a few basic tests, very non-invasive tests. So could you explain to us what the next steps are on that fertility workup path? It, it depends on uh, where the um, patient resides uh, and how the medical uh, system is structured there. But I think the primary care provider, at least in uh, Europe, is the general practitioner. So a general practitioner could organize female tests to include uh, ovarian reserve. These are all blood tests. Ovarian reserve with a hormone called AMH. Um, some uh, tests to verify if uh, endocrinologically she's okay, particularly if she has irregular periods, things like a thyroid gland testing and uh, pituitary gland testing. And then if the woman has regular periods, a progesterone level to verify that egg release or ovulation happens. And of course, some preventive measures that uh, one need to ensure that a smear test is up to date, that a patient is rubella immune, that uh, her vitamin D, vitamin C levels, folic acid are all within normal limits. For a male, a semen analysis test could also be organized under numerous services, uh, both in hospitals, but also in um, fertility units. Thank you, Dr. McCarney. Um, as I said, I'm Kate Bryan, I'm a former fertility patient and I work for Fertility Network UK, which is the country's leading charity offering support and advice to fertility patients from across England, Wales and Scotland. And I'm going to talk now to Professor Anne Hemingway. Anne, uh, could you introduce yourself? Hello, yes, good morning everyone. Um, my name's Anne Hemingway. Um, I'm a radiologist at Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust in London. I started in radiology um, when I uh, in 1979 and I've been doing HSG's hysterosalpingograms since um, 1996 so I have about uh, up, upwards of 12 to 15,000 um, HSG's um, that I've performed or assisted with um, uh, and that's my my main focus of interest is in the investigation of uh, women presenting with subfertility. Professor Hemingway, you're one of the leading experts on HSG. Could you explain to us a bit more about the procedure? Yes, of course. Um, an HSG is, or uh, hysterosalpingogram, is an X-ray test that's designed to um, show us the inside of the lady's womb or, or uterus and the fallopian tubes. In order to conceive spontaneously, um, a woman needs at least one um, patent open fallopian tube. Um, the test is done as an outpatient in the x-ray department, um, normally in the first half of a woman's menstrual cycle when she stopped bleeding. Um, and we would have asked her to not have um, intercourse from the first day of her cycle. So there's no chance she might have conceived before she has it in that cycle. Um, we then um, bring her into the x-ray room and the test is a bit like a smear test. Um, so we look past the speculum and look at the neck of the womb, the cervix, and then we pass a very soft little tube, no needles, nothing sharp, and we very gently put some fluid through that. It's a clear fluid, which we call a contrast, and it has iodine in it, and that's what we can see on the x-ray pictures. The patient's lying on an x-ray table, um, and a, it's like a giant camera um, is positioned over their lower part of their body, it doesn't touch them, um, and we can then look at the passage of that fluid as we gently put it into the womb of the tubes, on a TV screen, and the ladies often want to watch themselves as well. 
Um, in order to help it, we might tip the bed down a bit. We might roll the patient from side to side because gravity is great. We often get you to cough, laugh. Yes, you can laugh when you're having an HSG. We get lots of laughter in our room. Um, and we take some pictures um, to store to show what the womb and the fallopian tubes are looking like. Um, and then we uh, look at those later and do a report and we send them to the doctor who's, who's referred you to us. And how would you advise patients to prepare for the procedure? Right. First of all, when the doctors who are looking after you have referred you, they should give you a leaflet explaining the procedure. Please read that um, in detail. I then will caution, don't then Google it. Don't go to Dr. Google um, because it's completely unfiltered on the internet. But go to sites um, such as FMUK um, where the information has been collated and reviewed to look a bit more about the procedure. Um, if you have specific anxieties, don't hesitate to call um, the department where you're going to have it and discuss it beforehand. Um, I would say, up until COVID, we always said bring someone with you. Um, that's a bit more difficult now, but to see what the regulations are in your department um, where you're going. Um, arrive on time, really important, so you're not stressed and not rushing to sort of get there. Um, we understand that x-ray departments, it's often the first time a woman may have been into a hospital. Um, and so, you know, giving yourself time to arrive and find your way through the maze of departments to get to the right place is a good plan. Um, and uh, if you know that you, um, uh, you know, are anxious or that you have, you know, you, you find things uncomfortable, don't hesitate to take an analgesic, some painkiller beforehand if you want to, but we don't routinely recommend that. Thanks. We know that infertility is hugely stressful for both men and for women too, and that it can lead to depression and anxiety and mental health problems, and that fertility patients often report feeling isolated, cut off from their family and friends because they put their lives on hold. So seeking advice and help from a patient charity like Fertility Network UK can really make a difference because we offer um, both professional help from our support line and peer, -to peer support from our groups across the country. Fertility treatment can be a very lonely journey and knowing that you're not alone can really help to address that stress. I was wondering if you could share with us Anne some of your tips and tricks to reduce patient stress during the HSG. Yes, of course. Um, as I said earlier, it's often the first time in a, in a department and they are, you know, strange and bewildering places. It's really important that whoever's doing the HSG um, is empathetic and that the woman is when they are brought into the x-ray room that they understand that it's it's private we lock the doors we have all the staff in and we lock the doors so that you know nobody can come in who's not invited if you like. Um, and we always sit our ladies down, um, uh, talk through the whole procedure in a lot of detail, give plenty of time for questions and answers, um, and understand how um, anxious it, this process is. Because not only is the patient worried about what we might or might not find, but they're, they're anxious about the impact that this ha will have on, on their subsequent fertility journey. Um, so we need to give them space and time. The room needs to be warm. Um, we need to, we often have music playing and ladies seem to like that a lot. Um, I always say to people, if you like, if you do yoga and you want to do your yoga breathing, crack on. If you want to put your earphones in and listen to some music, absolutely fine with me. What keeps you relaxed is good news because actually that makes it less, it makes the whole process easier for us too. Um, so I think empathy, a dignified environment, understanding anxiety on our part is really important for the woman. And I always say to them that um, particularly if people have had difficulties before, I say, look, this is your body. This is test for you you're in charge tell me if I need to stop slow down that's fine and that I think is really empowering that the woman understands she's you know she can actually um, call the tunes while we're doing the test. Um, last time we did a webinar with you there were some comments from patients sharing their experiences with HSG on social media afterwards I wonder how you would address these reactions. Yes um, a, a lot of the women talked about pain um, and I that's, you know, I, I, I'm always very upset if, if a lady finds it um, painful. Um, nobody's kidding that this is top of your bucket list. Of course, it's not the most comfortable thing in the world, um, but um, we should do everything we can to make that um, it as pleasant and as bearable as possible. 
we all have a different pain threshold. If you know you have a, a, you know, a low pain threshold and you find smears painful and uncomfortable, two things. First of all, feel free to take another painkiller before you come. Secondly, tell, tell us before we start, because we, can, we have lots of different tricks and different size of equipment, and we can try and do our utmost to adjust it to you and individualize the process. Um, my whole motto doing an HSG is take your time, be slow, be gentle. Um, the rushing is not getting over with quickly is not the idea. We, if you take it slowly and very gently um, and listen to what the patient's telling you, um, then that is, is really important. We also have somebody in the room with us who chats away to you at the top and keep, you know, tries to keep you slightly distracted. And that can really help um, to, uh, you can sort of have somebody who's, if you like, your um, advocate at the top end of the bed, one of our nurses or, or staff. What are the benefits associated with HSG? Well, it's part of a jigsaw puzzle. Um, and uh, I always explain that to ladies and I always say it's a bit like the middle bit. Um, they've had um, an ultrasound, uh, which will show the outer parts of the, um, the womb and the, uh, the ovaries and the floping tubes and the surrounding structures blood tests which show things how things are functioning and their partner will have had a test um, and this is like the middle bit this shows what the inside of the womb and the tubes are looking like um, and her, it may be completely normal and that's great news because it will influence what your specialist advises you to do next we may find something correctable for example we may find that one or both of your tubes are blocked just where they join the the womb and at a later date we may be able in the x-ray department to pop those open and open the floping tubes we may find correctable things like a polyp or some scar tissue or something that your your specialist can deal with so um, it's, it's really giving um, a part of that jigsaw puzzle and another answer to help your specialist um, tailor your, the next steps of your treatment um, towards you. Some patients can feel a bit apprehensive about the idea of a contrast medium being injected during the test and about the radiation involved. I wonder if you could explain a bit more about that. Yes, um, contrast. the contrast, there's two different contrasts that we use. One is based on oil and one is based on water. They've both been around a long time. The oil-based contrast was actually developed in 1901 and the water-based contrasts have been with us since the 1950s. So they have been widely used and tested and so we know about their safety profiles. Um, we check whether you have any allergies before we start to make sure you might not have an allergic reaction to anything um, and that's that's really important um, and we use the smallest amount we can of eat either of the contrasts that will give us the information that's required um, and those are our um, sort of benchmarks um, and the uh, the, the contrasts that we use are sterile so um, we you know so that they're and um, we uh, no risk of infection from the contrast itself um, and uh, we can use either interchangeably depending on the woman and the, the condition. Talking about the radiation, the radiation, again, we're governed by law about how much radiation we can use for any specific um, examination. Um, and we work well within those parameters. So for example, in the UK, there's something called a dose reference level, um, which we know. And in our department, all our HSGs are conducted at well under one tenth of what is the national level that we're allowed to use. So we work very hard to keep it as a bare minimum. And by and large, um, with our HSGs in our department, the amount of radiation you'll get is about the same as if you would take a, take a transatlantic flight to somewhere in America or Australia. Um, and uh, we would say, you wouldn't think twice about conceiving on a holiday to either of those places, so don't worry too much because we have kept it to the bare minimum. Thank you. So what happens once the HSG is done? The results are then um, sent to um, uh, the specialist who uh, we would look at the pictures very carefully and write a report and the results will be sent to the specialist who sent you to us um, to, to then decide how that's going to impact your treatment. If we find anything particularly unusual, we will um, uh, then actually call the specialist or phone them, um, sometimes even while you're there. Um, so we have a very good rapport with the people who send you to us for the test um, and we will get that information to them in our department 
later the same day that you've had the test. Great, thank you very much, Professor Hemingway. Um, I'm now going to introduce Mario. Would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a bit about the work you do to help fertility patients? Absolutely. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, and my name is Mario Floss. And uh, besides that, I have myself experience with fertility problems. Uh, I also work as a volunteer for Freya, which is the uh, Dutch uh, organization, a patient organization for people with fertility problems. And today I actually have the pleasure to talk together with uh, Professor Neil Johnson. So, uh, Professor, could you introduce yourself as well, uh, please? Hello, Mario, and uh, hello, everybody. I'm, I should say good evening from, uh, from Auckland in New Zealand here, uh, which is where I'm a, uh, a gynaecologist and, uh, and fertility specialist. Uh, I'm also a visiting professor at the University of Adelaide, and I have a, um, an honorary position with the University uh, of uh, Auckland. I've got a strong special interest in endometriosis and uh, actually the president of the World Endometriosis Society currently. Um, but perhaps even more interestingly, uh, myself and my wife have experienced a fertility problem ourselves. So uh, it's been very interesting to encounter the fertility journey now from both sides. And uh, believe you me, I've been on the receiving end of care that uh, has been, I must say, quite unexpectedly variable at times from uh, uh, from quarters where I might have expected better. But uh, you know that patient journey is uh, is something that can be really tricky. So, so Mari, I wonder if you could tell us uh, a little bit more about uh, about, uh, about the patient journey, uh, patient organisations, fertility organisations, uh, and specifically uh, drawing on experience from your role with Freya. Mm, no, absolutely, uh, Professor. And and of course, as uh, I think I personally think that uh, patient organizations are super important in uh, in this area. And I mean, I work in this area for now uh, five or six years. Uh, and I mean, as Freya, we do a couple of things. I mean, uh, first of all, um, what we uh, what we do, we issue a magazine which we make four times a year, where we interview patients that uh, are in the fertility uh, journey. Uh, sharing stories, but we also interview people like uh, like yourself, Professor. I, I mean, people that are usually on the other side of the of the table, and they uh, they tell a story about, I mean, the medical backgrounds, for example, uh, or experiences that uh, that they have. But we try to cover a broad field as well. I mean, it was a couple of weeks ago when I actually interviewed a philosopher about purpose in life when uh, when you don't have the possibility to uh, to get children. I mean, it's a, it's a very broad uh, field as such. Uh, then what we also do is uh, we uh, organize activities and workshops, for example, where people can, uh, can meet uh, and hear stories about others. Because I, I think it was, uh, Kate, that you mentioned that, that one out of six couples has difficulties uh, with getting children. So you're not alone. So talking about this is one of the, one of the crucial ingredients in this uh, journey, I would, uh, would see. And then what we try to do is as well, I mean, to make the care for fertility treatments accessible for many people, I would say. Uh, so one thing that Freya did is to, to make sure that the first three treatments in the Netherlands are covered by the health insurance, which is a, a super good uh, achievement, I would say. And then maybe last but not least, I mean, that's the introduction session. So when uh, fertility patients are at the beginning of their journey uh, to be in the, in the hospital or the clinic, uh, or, or where possible to give an introduction. What can patients expect? What should they prepare for? Uh, potentially having someone with experience talking about the, the stories um, to give people the best start. Maybe a good question for you as well, Professor. What, uh, what, what would you advise from, uh, from your perspective when patients are at the beginning of their journey? Well, I suppose we've heard uh, a lot already, firstly from, uh, from Edgar about the baseline uh, investigations and then from Anne um, about the specialized uh, examination of the fallopian tubes. So I guess here we are sitting here with our diagnosis now in the, uh, uh, in the fertility clinic and the, uh, the next step uh, will really depend on, on what that diagnosis is. So there may be uh, for example, an ovulation dysfunction um, where uh, where the woman isn't ovulating uh, 
um, properly, the commonest cause for which would be polycystic ovary syndrome. So, for example, first-line treatment for this now would be letrozole, uh, and this has changed a little bit over the years. Um, we may have identified a tubal dysfunction through, through ANS HSG or perhaps even blocked fallopian tubes. Uh, and then, of course, IVF uh, is in play. Uh, uterine dysfunction, thinking of other female uh, factors, uh, that can be a little bit more challenging. And uh, uh, endometriosis, well, we might come to that in a moment. Uh, and then, of course, male factor. And, uh, uh, and if there is a substantial male factor, then one's looking at... Uh, uh, at ICSI as an adaptation uh, of uh, IVF. But, um, but let's not forget that, of course, the, uh, the investigation of uh, infertility is really pretty broad brush. Uh, and ultimately, a lot of patients end up with uh, a diagnosis, a rather unsatisfactory diagnosis, really, of unexplained fertility delay or unexplained infertility. And of course, we have, uh, we have strategies for this. Uh, but um, I think as Anne was starting to go into, um, uh, and I'm also particularly interested in, in HSG and particularly in oil-soluble contrast media. Ah, super, thank you. And also uh, Professor Hemingway was as well a little bit um, uh, looking into what are the things that a patient can do in their preparations for, I mean, all the investigations. <laughs> I mean, Professor Hemingway had a lot of good advice. Is there anything that, that, that you could add to that, uh, Professor Johnson? Well, um, I suppose um, in preparing for fertility treatment, um, uh, and I think we've learned an awful lot uh, about, um, about the impact of lifestyle factors, uh, not only on female reproductive health, but also now on male uh, reproductive health, because no longer is it acceptable um, to uh, produce good numbers of sperm. We now have to produce sperm of... Uh, of prime reproductive potential. So, uh, uh, so I think, you know, the lifestyle factors, the obvious ones are uh, giving up smoking if that's an issue, uh, avoiding uh, recreational drugs, um, alcohol, um, minimization or ideally avoidance, um, caffeine. Um, you know, one strong coffee per day is probably uh, about enough or more than enough. Uh, so we're often giving advice uh, around this as well. Um, uh, optimizing one's fitness and uh, and weight and uh, you know not only have we seen a uh, a pandemic of the coronavirus but we've also seen well we've continued to see the obesity pandemic for uh, uh, for decade now uh, throughout uh, throughout the world and and these are all factors that can uh, that can impact on um, uh, on the uh, outcome of, uh, of fertility treatment. And of course, it is emotionally stressful to undergo uh, fertility, well, firstly, infertility and, and also fertility treatment. So it is important to uh, ensure that we're uh, well uh, supported uh, emotionally and that, and that stress levels uh, are, uh, are minimized. Well, good ones, indeed. And as you mentioned, I mean, you are a highly recognized specialist in the area of endometriosis. And I think it would be really interesting to learn a, bit, uh, a little bit more about the uh, special things that that uh, disease brings yeah. with it. Hmm. Oh, thank you, Mario. Well, you know, uh, endometriosis, it's, uh, it's a tricky one. And uh, I think it's fairly obvious why severe uh, endometriosis causes uh, infertility with the damage that it can cause to fallopian tubes, even blocking them, the distortion of the anatomy uh, between the fallopian tubes and, uh, and ovaries and damage to the ovaries and even uh, damage and reduction of, uh, uh, of ovarian reserve. Uh, now, um, one that we don't always think about, but uh, certainly women with, uh, with endometriosis think about uh, and their partners is that it's, it's not always that easy to have sex at the right time of the cycle because it's painful uh, often at the time uh, of ovulation. So the, these are all factors uh, impacting fertility for women with endometriosis, but more, in a way more subtle than this. So, so even women with stage one uh, and stage two endometriosis can experience substantial fertility delay. We know this from, uh, from extensive data. So what's the reason for this? Well, 
Um, it's probably to do with, um, with an immunobiological thing. Um, so the environment within the pelvic cavity is altered when there's uh, endometriosis and it can be unfavorable to, uh, to eggs that are traversing the pelvic cavity from the ovary to reach the fallopian tube. It can be unfavorable to sperm and the interaction between uh, sperm and eggs. Uh, it can cause problems with transport through, through fallopian tubes uh, of, both, um, uh, of both eggs, uh, sperm, and of, uh, uh, and of embryos. And I think we're, we're learning even more now about the, uh, the normally placed endometrium, where, of course, the embryo is trying to implant. And we, uh, we've learned that, that endometrial receptivity uh, is lower in women uh, with endometriosis. So where uh, I suppose we've, uh, we've traditionally considered the, the treatment for uh, endometriosis-related infertility to be, well, uh, of course, IVF, uh, and this can get around some of the problems with uh, exposure of sperm uh, and eggs to the, uh, to the environment within the pelvic cavity, because, of course, fertilization is taking place outside of the body. Um, surgery for endometriosis. We've known that this for a long time, uh, in some cases, not in all cases, uh, but in some cases, can improve uh, fertility. The, the data on this has become a little bit less clear uh, in the sense that um, probably um, surgery isn't a fix-all for uh, fertility for all women with endometriosis, but I'm certain that there are women with endometriosis who do need to have this surgically removed before they can have a successful fertility outcome. But my special interest in endometriosis really emerged in all the research that I did um, well, as far back as 20 years ago, looking at uh, oil-soluble contrast media used through HSG. So, um, yeah, I mean, it can certainly be, uh, uh, be quite a journey, the whole fertility process. So um, I'm sure that you've got some advice, uh, Mario, for couples who are embarking on the fertility journey. And, uh, and what advice would you give to, uh, mm. uh, to patients who are, who are starting on the fertility journey? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, good question, Professor. And thanks for the, for the, for the answer. I mean, it's um, a couple of things I was uh, thinking. I mean, first of all, I mean, Professor Hemingway already mentioned, I mean, you're not alone in this. And I think that is something that, uh, that you often don't realize in the beginning. Uh, then I think secondly, I mean, talk about it. I mean, with your partner, with your friends, with your family at work. And I know that this is a bit of a hurdle. I mean, it is a, still a taboo subject. It's not that easy to talk about. But I mean, once you start talking about this, and I can see the, the stories everywhere always, then people recognize as You hear from others, ah, but I actually had a similar kind of uh, case or a friend. Mm -hmm. uh, and people can be there for you as well. I mean, people can give you the support that you need. Uh, and then as a last point, uh, and I think that was uh, mentioned as well, I mean, make sure that you are at the steering wheel. I mean, nobody is, uh, I mean, some people are working on a day-to-day -day basis with this, uh, but as a patient, you're often not familiar with the medical terms, with the choices that you need to make, with the options that you have. So ask questions. And um, I mean, that I really like what you said, Professor Hemingway, as well. Uh, I mean, uh, take the time in the hospital, but also make sure that you are at the steering wheel. Uh, because, I mean, it has a huge impact on uh, personal lives of people, uh, on your physical or mental health. Uh, so it's important to take the time for that and ask questions as much as you want so you are at the steering wheel. Uh, so that is what I would definitely like to, uh, like to share. That's really excellent advice, uh, Mario. And I think probably I, you know, from my own experience and... I think that sometimes uh, it's quite heartening to patients, and I will sometimes even mention this in the clinic that I, that I've had my own fertility journey, mm -hmm. uh, because I think that um, when you're being treated by someone who you know has not had that kind of journey, you know that they just don't completely and utterly get what uh, what you're going through. So um, yeah, that's. Um, I think we've covered some very, very interesting ground there uh, uh, today. Uh, and I'd now like to, uh, to hand back to, uh, to Edgar Mokanu uh, at this point. Uh, and I wonder if you have any uh, additional comments to make, uh, uh, Edgar. Thank you very much. Um, very interesting discussion.
it's uh, nice to see that um, um, patients are now put first. It's uh, also impressive to see that the group of specialists that have been invited uh, have both views of the treating physician and also the receiving uh, patient. Um, and um, yes, I, I personally used to do a lot of laparoscopy, but um, I have to say that uh, many years ago, I've decided that I have to give my patients the option as opposed to suggesting go for an invasive procedure. And um, many times, uh, there's a question that came in in relation to a hysterosopringogram. Somebody got pregnant after a hysterosopringogram, had a miscarriage, should she go and have another one two years later? And there's no doubt that um, there is a certain rhythm in the investigations and jumping to the most expensive and complex and high risk procedure without uh, a very good indication might be counterproductive. So um, to finish what I was saying, uh, many years ago, I used to be very hands-on surgery, but I'm, I still am, but patients have a choice. And uh, if I believe uh, less invasive and more holistic approach, more time for each other, more uh, time off work, more holidays uh, can give uh, as good results as any medical intervention. It's just letting nature uh, take its core, take its course. So I think um, I have nothing else, but I'm happy to take any other questions from um, anybody. Thank you. So hello. I, I see that a question has come through. Sorry, um, Kirsten. Um, should I answer the question that came through uh, on the, I think it was Q&A, about endometriosis? I, I suspect that might have been directed towards me. Yes, exactly. There's a question saying, what would be your best advice for a woman who has been suffering from endometriosis since a long time and experienced many failures to get pregnant? Mm. So endometriosis for a long time, uh, repeatedly unsuccessful uh, fertility endeavors um, and presumably infertility for a long time as well. Um, well, I, I think that, that we have more strings to our bow potentially than we ever used to have. Um, and so um, surgery is, uh, as Edgar was saying, is, is a reasonable option. It can improve fertility. There are some women who just don't get pregnant until they've had their endometriosis laparoscopically removed. Um, uh, the, um, the way that we do IVF uh, as well is um, th there is some evidence that, that suppression of endometriosis with GnRH analogs before IVF uh, can be helpful, and this can also help to promote certain factors within the, within the endometrium that make it more receptive. So different ways of doing IVF, different protocols. But as I was mentioning earlier on, I think the, um, I think the, the kind of thing that Anne Hemingway is now offering, and during that time, one can look at other options such as such as IUI. So I, I think with 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 that kind of background, I would say give oneself uh, as m as much opportunity uh, through as many different approaches uh, because we now have many more approaches than we previously had. So I think it's uh, it's not as bleak as it used to look. Thank you very much, Professor. I have another question here for, for Dr. Mokeno, which is, is there an ovarian reserve or a number of unsuccessful homologous IVF cycles, low response or low quality, after which you would recommend pushing a heterologous IVF path? Thank you. Um, so, Obviously, if the reserve is extremely low, very, very low, and particularly if the ultrasound doesn't show evidence of any antral follicles, um, pursuing IVF might not be the wisest choice. It also depends on the age of the woman. A, a female patient with a very low reserve, yet 
in her might not early 30s, there might be a response where maybe two eggs or three eggs could be collected. And this will still offer the opportunity of creating an in vitro embryo that could result in a pregnancy. While a female with an advanced age, over 40, over 43, with a very low reserve, the quality of the egg also will uh, be less than optimal. And the likelihood to conceive, even in the presence of an embryo, will be extremely slim. Next question, maybe you can answer that as well. If my HSG was normal, is it just a case of waiting or can I request more tests after this? What questions should I be asking my fertility doctor? Yes, um, well, it depends on the background of the uh, fertility question. I'll try to summarize it. If the female is young and she has a very low reserve, it is probably worthwhile pursuing one cycle of IVF, even if the number of eggs will not be very large. If the female has an advanced age and the ovarian reserve is very low, particularly if she had one cycle of treatment, it might be wise to look at the uh, heterologous IVF procedure. Uh, with the male, um, the question also refers a number of unsuccessful homologous IVF cycles. So here are the emotional aspects, a discussion with the physician face-to-face -face where the pros and cons of pursuing further treatment and particularly the alternatives, the risks uh, and the success rates were nearly the same cost possibly, uh, they need to be dissected. So as a general rule, if you had one or two cycles of treatment with good embryos but no pregnancy established, have a discussion about a third one. But after three cycles of treatment, one should consider doing something different and even um, going the heterologous idea. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Um, I have another question concerning the concerning endometriosis. Uh, so I imagine this would be for uh, Professor Johnson. So um, Elena Eleni is asking whether you would suggest acupuncture, aloe vera consumption, etc., as possible holistic aid to the process of IVF? Yeah, I mean, it's very interesting. Acupuncture um, as an adjunct or an add-on to IVF is probably one of the most researched um, uh, medical interventions in, in fertility. And uh, it seems strange, doesn't it, in that it's widely considered to be a complementary uh, uh, intervention. But... Um, yeah, so we see mixed results from from adding acupuncture to IVF. My distillation of all of this, and I've been involved in uh, some systematic review work uh, on this, as well as in a primary randomized trial. Incidentally, our primary randomized trial, the biggest of all of those conducted so far, which compared acupuncture with sham acupuncture, did not show any benefit through uh, uh, uh adding to IVF. However, if you take all of the RCTs as a totality, um, and if particularly if you consider acupuncture versus no intervention, so no sham acupuncture, then you do see a significantly beneficial effect on the uh, of the impact on uh, fresh embryo transfer uh, in IVF. There really aren't enough studies to, to say whether it's uh, of any benefit outside of IVF, but I suppose one might assume that it, that it may be, given that, that the similar mechanisms, mechanisms would, be, uh, would be involved. Uh, and then the question extends to, um, are there supplements which, uh, which can help? Aloe vera, I think, was mentioned. I don't think we know any specific uh, supplements which uh, which are helpful uh, for uh, for endometriosis, but you know the, the natural approach to improving fertility, as we were talking about lifestyle, uh, etc. All of these things can be can be quite helpful to get one's body in shape for fertility treatment. W one other thing that I was going to say is that we were talking just now about 
uh, about low ovarian reserve and and doing IVF and ways of doing IVF, I think sometimes patients can get onto an IVF treadmill that is very difficult to step off. Um, and sometimes it's good just to have a little rethink. Is IVF absolutely necessary? Because if there is a chance of natural conception, there can be ways um, of boosting one's fertility. And in the context of low ovarian reserve, I'm strongly of the view that, that, that there is value in the month on month on month opportunity to get pregnant through natural, uh, more natural conception. Whereas with low ovarian reserve, often with IVF, you can't even collect an egg, let alone have a successful uh, implantation and, uh, and live born baby. So yeah, just sometimes it's important to back the trucker. Um, we have one more question here, I think that goes into the same uh, group of questions. Maya must ask to help blood, fl blood flow. Do you have any thoughts on that? Sorry, what is Maya massage actually? Oh, sorry. What is, what, what is Maya massage? Can someone tell me? Um, <laughs> I don't know. We'll have to, hopefully the, the person who asked the question will give us a little bit more information. I, I presume this is some form of traditional massage yeah. which, which feeds into a, an attempt to enhance blood flow to the pelvic organs. That's, that's what I'm, I'm guessing and there are different sort of uh, traditional massages that are um, that um, are said to do this. Um, it's difficult um, because, you know, we always have to judge medical interventions by particular standards of are they effective or not. I don't know any um, hard edge data, really strong data, for example, from randomized trials that really show that that massage is or intended to improve blood flow will improve fertility. Nonetheless, you know, there aren't actually many trials of that nature around. So I guess that's, that's the challenge, my challenge to the person asking the question, if they're in a position to organize a trial to really look at that in a robust way, I'd be very interested in the answer to that question myself. Actually, it says here, but I think you answered the question, is that it's a massage of the female reproductive area in Chinese uh, traditional medicine. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a question here for Mario. Um, so do you think that the doctors involve men sufficient, sufficiently in the whole process? Mm -hmm. uh, and oh. would you care to tell us about your own experience on that? Yeah, absolutely. No, I think this is still a, an opportunity actually going forward. Of course, a lot of the treatments are, are for women. I mean, that, that's often where you, I mean, there are treatments for men as well, but the majority as far as what I have seen is on, on, the, on, the, on the women's side. Then, I mean, naturally the focus goes out more to the, to the women. It's also physically heavy uh, treatment. Um, then I think, um, I mean, the, the man can be more involved. And I mean, uh, one of you mentioned that as well today in, in the chats. I, f I forgot who. I mean, the man, it was uh, Professor Mocano, actually, uh, that, that the, man's are, the men are often forgotten, sometimes in the, uh, in, in, in the problem search, but also, I mean, in the mental parts, I mean, to support their wife. Also, it has an impact on their life. And I think it makes a huge difference if the specialist asks as well, I mean, how is it going with you? Because I mean, in those examples where I've seen where that happens, it makes a major difference for the, for the, for the man, I would say. And that's also what I, can, what I can personally feel, but also talking a lot with men that I interview for our magazine, I can really see that makes a huge difference. Absolutely, good question. Could I, could I just say something um, as well? Um, when women come for their HSG, they will often say, can they bring their, uh, their partner with them? Um, and we certainly allow the partner in the room for the chat and the discussion so they know and can ask questions too. We don't let them stay in the room for the, for the actual x-ray because of the radiation. Um, but um, often afterwards, um, they, you know, if we, the, we will let them come in and look at the picture if, if, mm. if the one wants them to um, try and involve them. Um, and um, I, I've said previously, always at the end, particularly both there, I say, listen, you two, you've had a, this has been mm. stressful. Go off together and sit mm. down and have a 
cup of coffee and a cake together and just sit and unwind a little bit afterwards because I think I think we need to understand the stress um, involved mm. and yes we certainly try and involve partners as much as possible when they come for their HSG. Super good yeah. Thank good. You. Yeah, it's a really good point, Anna. And if I can just add to that, uh, th th there were some questions earlier on about supplements. And, um, and I think with regard to the guys, that's actually where there really is probably better evidence of the use of supplements to improve fertility than perhaps even for women. Um, so where there is male factor, uh, male factor contribution to fertility delay, um, if a man is using a, a preparation that involves antioxidants, and look, you know, there are many of them out there on the market containing sort of everything that it takes to make a sperm as well as antioxidants, etc. But, but there is good evidence that, that, the, that men using uh, antioxidants and not forgetting that it takes uh, 70 plus days to make a sperm, so they need to be quite diligent about this. And men are notoriously not so diligent about this, uh, about continuing to take it. But, um, but, but there is good evidence that it does improve the overall outcome. So it's worthwhile. So... Here, there's uh, somebody who's asking, my doctor pres prescribed myo inositol as I'm trying to conceive and have PCOS. Any feedback on that? I don't know whether, uh, Edgar, would you like to answer to that question? Yes, with pleasure. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know why you don't have me on screen. Um, with pleasure. There isn't a lot of evidence um, in terms of immediate impact of myoinositol. And aware that this is a patient-focused um, activity, I'm not going to talk about Cochrane database and so on, but just to say that analyzing published evidence on the impact of inositol for subfertile women with polycystic ovary does not show an immediate benefit. Yet, we have to remember that just because studies don't show a benefit doesn't mean that a specific patient that might be uh, interested in taking this prescribed medication will not have a, uh, a positive response. Um, we know that studies sometimes are weak. Um, we also have to look at would it cause any harm? Uh, and I'm not aware that it can cause harm. So. Um, if you say, should I have acupuncture or should I take myoinositol, uh, then obviously um, they could be comparable. So if your physician thinks that here for you, uh, I would be in favor of taking it. Uh, but is there good evidence that says that everybody with polycystic ovaries should be taking myoinositol? No, there isn't such evidence. We don't know if it improves birth rate or clinical pregnancy rates or so on. We don't have that evidence. But as I said, I don't think there is a perfect answer to this question. There's many uh, empirical, empirical, non-proven treatments um, that yeah. um, people want to take or uh, so. Yeah. I think it's very important to stress here that this um, you know, webinar, we've organized this for informational purposes to give patients as much information as possible uh, about their condition and how to take care of themselves. But this will never replace um, the consultation with their own healthcare professionals that they should also always speak to about whatever questions they may have. Uh, are you involving a professional for psychological impact of the journey is a very tough one. I think that this is key to survival through the fertility and assisted fertility process. And um, um, not only that you should seek advice, uh, I think that's very important. Even if the service does not provide such advice, do seek the advice of a professional that could offer both the female and the male uh, emotional support in understanding the diagnosis, in pursuing the therapies before any fertility therapy, like, you know, just life adjustments, mm -hmm. in supporting your journey through the active treatment a part of your uh, infertility treatment. So uh, there, is, there are many societies, national societies, and in fact, even 
um, reproductive societies now incorporate or work together with professional uh, counseling societies. Um, so yes, that, that should be part, an integral part of any fertility service. Okay, thank you very much. Mario, do you want to conclude? Absolutely. I mean, it, uh, like you said, uh, I mean, today we were together to talk a little bit about the patient journey and fertility management. And we heard many stories pro from the professionalist, I mean, in treatments, causes, uh, and, and a lot of tips that hopefully uh, the patients that are at the beginning of their journey can, can help moving forward. Uh, I mean, thanks a lot for organizing this webinar. It was a pleasure to, to participate from my side. I mean, thanks for all the uh, the professors and, uh, and, and specialists that joined today, uh, but also the, to the participants to listen in. I mean, right now live with us, but also the ones that, uh, uh, that look back later on. So thanks a lot for joining today. And uh, yeah, maybe see you in the next webinar. So thank you. Thank you, a pleasure being here. See thank you. Thanks very much for inviting us. Thank you. Here, here. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to go back. Uh -huh.